Welcome back to another round with your usual suspects. Or unusual suspects, as the case may be. Yeah. There we go. Oh, Scott, there you go. <laughs> um, welcome. Tonight we are going to talk about... Oops. How's that? Is that better? We are going to talk about Bruno, everybody. I know we're not <laughs> supposed to, but that's what's um, going to happen. Uh, we are going to talk about Scott Collins... And the Flash. Who? Oh. Yeah, that's you, Scott. Oh. <laughs> so I felt kind of bad about um, promoting your name like that uh, because you are <laughs> a big star. And uh, I knew that I could do whatever I wanted because we've been friends for so long. So I didn't really even ask you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just to be honest, you didn't really ask me. You just decided it was going to be about Scott today. Yeah, well, I, mean, I like Scott, so that works yeah. out pretty good. Uh, I mean, I, I threw up, I threw up a like, you know, I ran up the flagpole. I I saw who saluted. Yeah, I mean, you know, let's not air all of our another round dirty laundry on air, but let's just say we're still refining our selection process. There you go. There you go. So tonight we're going to talk about the Flash. We're going to talk about Scott Collins. We're going to talk about the phenomenon of uh, his worldwide fame. So, but mostly- well, we can just talk about, you know, the, the mechanics a little bit of, yeah, of drawing a, a speedster or right. um, handling those focuses of a project. So I think the easiest way to do that, well, is like, I'm gonna do a flash drawing and Scott is gonna tell me how to make it into a good flash drawing. <laughs> And I'm going, oh, to try we'll to, goes, but sure. I'm going to try to be as uh, functionally disruptive as possible. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> right. So without, without, the interrupting, without, without interrupting the speed force, if you will. Exactly. <laughs> well, so I'm going to put not... my banner up next time. Right now, I've just got my partner is working on this. breaking their script into Act 1, Act 2, Act 3. And I realized, like, well, my background is just a, what, like the equivalent of a white erase board. i got to get some drawings up there. Ooh. There you go. Nice running drawings, Mr. Johnson. All right, so that I'm going to trace that off, and that's the the prelim drawing that I did of a guy, basically a guy running. Right. So I'm going to I'm going to draw that, and then while I'm doing that, Scott can tell me how to make it into. Uh, to do it better. To do it better, yeah. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. What are you What are you drinking, Scott? I just got some drink? hot tea because uh, I'm still, a little like, under the weather. You sound like you left your voice a little bit back in Amsterdam. I did, and and a few pounds of uh, Kleenex and everything else. Hello, Donald. Jeff definitely keeps it real with the old school light box. Um, <laughs> yeah, which is which is probably really good. I mean, something for any of you uh, professional or aspiring professional artists out there. Like repetitive motion is uh, no joke, um, and. Yep. And, the, and when we sit here and draw all day, and I've noticed, so Scott still works mostly by hand, yeah. you know, like on, on pen to paper. And yep. Jeff has come up with a pretty good hybrid system, but I'm someone about 10 years ago that switched to going almost entirely digital. And I found it's created more body issues because I think any of you that are artists out there, you know, like if you're drawing on a piece of paper, your body is always, you're kind of making these micro adjustments all the time because you're always kind of twisting the paper and turning it and you're doing stuff. And so even though you're still hunched over a drawing board all day, it just, it invites a lot more movement and stuff. But most of all of our drawing problems have a rotate tool that you can just control with your left hand. And so you're actually staying in almost the exact same position all day while you're drawing, 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 yep. which is not good for your body, unless you're Dusty Abel, who we need to have on the show at some point Absolutely. he just he just drives a cintiq like he's a big bus driver he's just <laughs> like oh i gotta draw it over here all right let me just turn the whole damn thing which i need to start resorting it's probably a good lat workout too but it probably yes, is bill o'donnell yes scott's got some con crud as the uh, saying goes in the industry oh it's the worst it's inevitable 
Oh, but yes. All right, Scott's having hot tea. Jeff, what the hell are you drinking? Oh, yeah, um, you can't awesome. see it, but I just have a Bud Light. Ooh. And I'm yeah. drinking Curiosity Cola. Ooh. Nice. What flavor would this Curiosity be? Well, it is cola flavored, for one. It uh, is. It, they tell me it's botanically brewed. I'm not sure how botanical brewing is different from any other kind of brewing, but... <laughs> Is it a smoother cola? It's delicious. It has a little bit more of the cola nut taste in it. It's reminiscent of a of an of a cola flavored icy. Not it's not a cola flavored Slurpee, but a cola flavored icy. <laughs> and if you're a child of the '70s and the '80s, you know there is a big difference. You, you, you better know. Yeah. Um, all right. Anyway, Jeff is drawing a beautiful flash. Scott, how can we make it better? Save Jeff. Um. Well, uh, to my mind, beginning with, yes, that when I started on Flash and I was working on pieces like this, this was a, actually a tryout piece that I did. Um, I don't know if you guys remember in that uh, Wells Fargo um, uh, building that we were in, uh, the studio that we had there, I did this cover completely on spec of like trying to get the cover gig. Oh, wait, really? I don't. Oh, yeah, that's right. Because uh, I colored it on your iMac. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because you were drawing the book, but you had not got the covers yet. Right. Uh, Brian Bowen was doing all sorts of nice covers before all that time, but I was being that uppity, you know, 30 or something comic creator who wanted to do his own covers. The only thing I ever did on Jeff's iMac was play that Star Wars game that was popular in the late 90s. <laughs> yeah, you guys were all playing that game. I even played it a little bit. Yeah. Um, but to start with this Flash stuff, really what I need to go back to um, and explain to everybody is that I did try and do my research when I was working on that stuff and when I was starting on the book, because it wasn't just a fill-in gig or whatever it was. I was really trying to break it down as to what I wanted to do um, with the book since I was given it as a monthly job. So I looked at old Carmine stuff. I love this figure. I love the the oh, smooth yeah. and um, I love the feathering of the speed lines. Before um, we get into how how brilliant Carmine Infantino is, actually, do you, could I ask a question that maybe folks out there might want to know, which is like, sure. how, how did the Flash job come together? How did you end up getting oh. the job to work on the Flash and work with the legendary Jeff Jones? Uh, completely fair question. Um, so uh, I had been doing, I had done a uh, about a year long run of Legion of Superheroes and then some other odds and ends at DC. Um, uh, of different projects, and then uh, one with the Legion for any Legion fans out there. Yep, um, and those were that was a real fun Legion run that had uh, Alan Davis doing covers. Ooh, um, yeah, that was great stuff. Yeah, um, and then uh, Joey Cavallari, who I'd worked with a few times, uh, editor at Marvel and DC. Um, he's the one who called me up when we were in that Wells Fargo building in Berkeley, and um, offered me the monthly gig after I had done a single issue. I don't think I can't remember. No, I did. Yeah. The, uh, I had done basically a tryout issue that I didn't know was a tryout. I did the, uh, honeymoon of Wally West and, uh, Linda. Um, oh, wow. So you done, yeah. you done a fill in was Joey Calvi, uh, was he the editor of the flash? Yeah. At that time? Okay. Yeah. For a minute, I was trying to remember if Brian was Brian Augustine was the editor. Um, Brian Augustine rest in peace. Um, but Brian wasn't, he was the writer of that uh, issue, that fill-in issue that I drew. Hmm. Um, and for Brian, I'm sure it wasn't a fill-in. Uh, I believe he took over the book after Mark Wade had moved down. <clears throat> um, Brian was a regular writer at that point, but I just did the one issue that was the honeymoon issue. Um, and that was like a, a trial by fire test thing or whatever. And it went really smoothly. Um, that was one of those things that uh, I think you and I, or uh, the three of us had talked about around that time was, you never knew about which gig you'd get, you know, which ones would just kind of like roll off the pencil and come easily right. or which gigs you'd get that all of a sudden you'd be fighting with the figure of this one. And how do I do this? And how do I do the powers of this one and, and have any sort of difficulty with it. And with the flash one, and I had never run, run had never drawn a running character before really um, not Quicksilver or any of that stuff. Um, and it came pretty easily. It was just flowing off the pencil. It wasn't uh, any sort of, uh, pushing to do better at this or that, it just kind of came to me. Um, so then about, I don't know, a month or so later, um, after that issue, I think made the rounds and they got approval or whatnot, uh, Joey called based off of that issue and offered me the monthly of the book. 
And then we get into the convoluted story that uh, Jeff was not the writer at the time when I was mm. off the book. Um, I think Scott McCloud was, and then he didn't, he backed out of the job or the job changed. So he didn't continue. Uh, Jerry Ordway was apparently, um, he was writing it for a hat, half a second. I want to say there were a couple more names that popped in that Joey every week was telling me that some other guy was writing the book um, <laughs> until he'd run through his initial stable of people that he was trying to get in there and they had all uh, not worked out. So he asked me if I had any suggestions and I had just worked with Jeff on some fill in issues of Stargirl oh. of stars and stripe was the comic book. Um, and we had a great time working together. And during that time we were working on pitches of different DC books we wanted to do together um, and during that time, he told me that Flash was his favorite book and that eventually he'd like to get on that book. So mm -hmm. I suggested Jeff to the editor and everything worked out. That's amazing. I never knew that. It, I never knew that story. So I'm extremely glad that I asked. Yeah, it was a funny scenario of any, uh, you know, falling of dominoes to do that stuff. Because then we also went through, uh, there was a regular col colorist on the book at the time. And I had to talk with him about what I wanted to do with the book. Um and then that didn't work out. And then we went through a bunch of different names for colorist. Um, wound up uh, falling upon James Sinclair, who had around that time colored some Hellboy stuff. Mm. Um, so then I suggested him. And then they had Digital Chameleon do the separations on the computer stuff. And it was, you know, I, there were so many pieces of that puzzle that could have gone wrong anywhere along the way um, with the letter, with the coloring, any of us. Um, that uh, all the risks we took um, uh, added up, it, it worked out all right. We were extremely lucky and fortunate, or however you want to look at it, that uh, we were all headed in kind of the right direction. But so when I got the gig and was offered the gig, and I talked to Mike Carlin about it, and he said, you know, give us a Scott Collins flash, some other flash that we haven't seen before. Um, within all of that, I took a look at all of these uh, previous guys who had done flash. So I looked at Carmine. Here I looked at Perez, of course. Mm -hmm. um, I loved his Kid Flash stuff um, through all the Teen Titans and everything. And I think he'd even done some Flash covers around this time. Um, and it was much more sleek in some ways than the uh, Infantino stuff. Sure. Um, but it was all good and, and I don't know, inferring the speed and all those possibilities, the dynamics. Um, I think by that point, the first uh, nail had come out with Davis. Oh, Plus, that stuff um, is so good. I don't have them here. I thought I got one, but I don't. Um, Davis had done a run of covers on Flash um, right after Rowingo, I think. Um, I, just and realized that Scott, I just realized Scott was controlling the stream yard. I'm like, how is Jeff drawing and so oh, yeah, perfectly no. in sync with what Scott is saying? This is incredible. By, by the way, in case anyone doesn't know, doing a show, there's lots of moving parts. And tonight, Scott is taking care of many of those moving parts. Well, I only gag. Some people might <laughs> say that Scott is, is TCOB. He's taking care of business. Right? Yeah, he's to Cobb. Uh, so I looked at Davis. Um, there's some other guys in here I don't have their artwork of. I know I looked at Carlos Pacheco, who had done sort of a short run on Flash. Oscar Amenez, I want to say, was another guy around that time. Yeah. Um, and those Mr. Kind of artists had really brought a real, um, almost to my mind, manga flavor to the Flash stuff, which was real interesting. Um, well, and, and then, of I course, I looked at Waringo as well. I was going to say, may he rest in peace. Like, my, Mike was very much present in everyone's brain at that point because he was the guy who had, you know, catapulted off the Flash into, uh, he, you know, he, he he really made a name for himself on the Flash, you know. Absolutely. Um, yeah. and no, I remember it catching my eye at the time that I had seen some of the Flash artists that had come and gone, um, and great ones in there. Whatever, Greg LaRoque, a lot of great guys. Jackson um, Jackson Geis's run on uh, when he first took over after the uh, the crisis, after crisis. was absolutely yeah, that was a great run. Butch yep. is awesome. No yeah, pun intended. No pun there. intended, Jeff. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so then it came time to me starting to do this stuff. And this was actually one of my rare, this first piece was one of my rare um, trials where I tried to do the multi-foot thing, yeah. show each foot as it's, you know, coming, going, raising, lowering, all that kind of stuff. To Should some degree, of, uh, it, it worked. Um, I remember at the time when this came out, though, I remember hearing people uh, critique it, saying mm -hmm. that he looked like an octopus. But what? 
Yeah. That was a critique you got. He looked like an octopus. Not, not from DC directly with that. It was it was somebody in fandom, I remember. But that was because of the shot you drew where he had eight arms, though, right? Not yeah, yeah. because of this. <laughs> I, I always loved like one of the things I think is interesting about drawing comics is how do you depict superpowers? And you know, I always had it super easy because super strength is is a breeze. You just have them lifting heavy crap. But like drawing speed stuff, you really I think created a cool visual effect for it jeff, jeff i don't think that is i mean just to momentarily get off i don't think that is easy i think part of why you made the wonder man stuff look so good and still do whenever you still get a commission or whatever is that gotta sell that weight right yeah. like e even if you're selling how light it is comparatively like drawing a really good tank or a really good truck or car helps sell you know, the fact that your character is super strong. So I don't, I don't think it is necessarily easy per se. You know? Sure. Yeah. I think, thanks. The trick that I always use is I, I made the weight seem believable. Like if, even if Wonder Man was lifting something that was crazy heavy, I had his feet sinking into the ground, even though right. it, he might not be struggling, the environment around him was suffering. Absolutely. Jeff, you drew the Flash. So you you drew the Flash in that comic that you drew with Derek that Fabian uh, Nicieza wrote, right? The Justice League Nightmare. Uh, uh, Midsummer's Nightmare. Yeah, Derek and I did the art chores on that, and Fabian and I was it Mark Wade did the writing on that. Oh, did Wade script it? I can't was remember. Was that was that your first time drawing the Flash for money? Um, besides yes. maybe the odd. The yeah, odd. yeah. I think that was the first time I drew him. And the truth is, I don't think I drew him doing too much flashy type stuff. He wasn't the center of the show for your story, no. 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 It was, I mean, I drew him running around, but I mean, to be honest, I think I might have just stolen old uh, Perez special effects. <laughs> I mean, if we're going to call a spade a spade. <laughs> you know, just, with, well, your <coughs> with your love of drawing multiple panel shots of like spider-man and solitaire and acrobatic characters i wonder if you've been given the flash if you would have taken that kind of approach you know i i 100 would have um but as and looking as so doing the prep for this show scott did that so many times it's it's crazy hard <laughs> it takes so much time right. well, well and yeah. you gotta keep you know uh, roving around and finding different things like here yeah. After a bunch of issues of drawing all sorts of different stuff, I started coming up with these poses where I had to figure out not only the running poses, but the stopping poses or the um, sliding mm. the panel poses. Or that's a great shot, though, Scott. The weight on the back, right? That he's coming to a halt. <clears throat> yeah, yep. skidding almost. Yep. But uh, doing the multi-figure thing, right? It really is. It re I mean, I just have an example of that today. On hey, I can talk about my job now. Um, sure. Yay. So on the Kung Fu Panda show I'm working on at DreamWorks um, right now <clears throat> premieres this summer. Jack Black is the voice. Please tune in. Um, awesome. That, uh, like uh, one of our episodes is trying to lock and one of our directors is this great uh, director that Jeff has worked with too on uh, DC's Public Enemies. His name's Mike Gogan. Uh, um, Mike's awesome. And uh Mike just needed just a quick amount of panels that were just being added into this sequence at the last second. And some of them were just Poe, you know, it's like just some Poe faces. And, and I'm like, oh, great. And then the rest is like, oh, good. It's just five panels. No big deal. But it was the whole group of characters. And it was like suddenly it took me three times as long because <laughs> yeah. it's like now you've turned it into a group shot. And I guess if you're doing multiple shots of Spider-Man or Flash or whatever, you're turning your solo book into a group book, you know? Absolutely. Or like those old burn uh, iron fist shots or whatever, where he'd draw 15 shots of Danny Rand tumbling down the stairs or- Oh yeah. There's a great uh, issue oh, where he fights cool. Captain America. I think it was super influential on me at a very early age. Same, no, my, no. my favorite image of that I can remember is when uh, he and Luke Cage were first you know, Byrne drew the three issues where they first teamed up at Power Man and Iron Fist. And there's one where they're at a party in these uh, discus and and, uh, and stiletto, maybe, or something like these two creepy white supremacist brothers, like, hmm. break in on the party. 
and uh, he shoots all these little knives at 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 Iron Fist, and and there's just a multi panel thing of like you know like Danny Rand's batting them all out of the air, and he did like you know four or five shots of Danny in the same shot. It's a great. Here, Bill says that I did the Matrix, but what you're explaining right there is the Matrix. Uh, it's, totally. you're, yeah. you're so right. I just realized that. Pow, yeah. pow, 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 pow. All right, Scott. So here's my first how to draw the flash question. All right. So I skipped ahead and I just drew a, a, a hyper running pose. You actually, right. your, your running poses were actually never that like, they, they were never that, ex I mean, they were exaggerated, but it always seemed like he was running, but not like necessarily sprinting because he was just so fast. How did you? Well, choose? yeah, that was the thing was to try and find those poses that inferred the most amount of speed. Um, your running pose there is very natural in some ways, although you know hyper um, uh, everything's extended kind of a thing. Right. But like this one, I think of when you were drawing that pose. You showed me that earlier. This is the page I thought of. Oh, I yeah. had drawn something similar because it's a profile shot of running. Yeah. Um, but different than yours, um, you've got like the foot on the ground coming forward. Um, yours has some weight to it as it's running. Mm -hmm. You can feel him, you know, kind of making contact with the street below that kind of thing. Right. Um, where often when I was drawing him doing that stuff, um, when he was stopping or doing something like that, I would put the weight on it. So it felt like he was in contact, but quite often, um, right or wrong, um, when I was doing it, it didn't, what my flash didn't necessarily make contact with the road, at least not in mid stride. Um, there were other ones like this where it kind of still felt like he was in contact with the road, even though it's a, uh, a weird, uh, different shot with a, a weird background. But, um, but often mine wouldn't necessarily be that I was striving for such speed at most times that, um, I wasn't necessarily having him do that. Unless it was this kind of shot where he was slowing down and skidding. I wish I had some of those other ones in here. That's interesting. But, it's almost as though you were just having him being propelled by the speed force and not yeah. necessarily running faster. Yeah. Again, it was after looking at the, the previous guys, Perez and Davis and Infantino and Roringo and all that stuff, I was trying to find what my voice was going to be in doing all of that. Um, and uh, the, the poses that I wound up drawing that I liked the best were the ones where – um, uh, again, unless he was stopping or starting, um, I didn't have him actually pounding the pavement per se with his boots. Right. He was more just, uh, yeah, skipping across, almost flying across in those running poses. I like that. That makes a lot of sense. As I, as I was drawing it, I realized that one of the reasons I feel like my drawing looks clunky is that you actually were doing a much more elegant solution to speed running than just running really fast. Yeah, I wound up being a lot more poetic, I guess, in some ways than um, naturalistic or whatever, like your pose right there. Hmm. All right, um, well, that's lesson number one. That's secret number one. <laughs> if we could have a graphic that would come up there that says secret number one. Secret number one, you put, a, fact. you put a pin in that for sure. Oh, we should have those graphics, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So that's secret number one. Now, my next question is, how do you choose where the lightning comes from? Um, well, the first thing I tried to usually do was to have the lightning come off the lightning parts of his costume, mm -hmm. uh, like the belt, like the armbands, um, right. even like the uh, um, the earpieces. Um, and then it was also, again, like of trying to simplify what would work tiny figure or work a big figure. Um, when I was drawing the ear pieces, the wings, right. um, when he was running, when he was actually using speed force and going, I would not draw the ear pieces in as those metal parts. Oh, you would just turn them into lightning? <laughs> yep. After the disc that's on the side of his head, right. uh, the point where the ear pieces would start with the wings coming out of them, that would suddenly become lightning. Hang on. Let me, let me bring this up a little bit closer to Cam. Right. Gotcha. <laughs> That's such a <laughs> <good concentration. laughs> yeah all right okay that makes sense i like that that's that's an education right there all right i mean everybody does it their own way but yeah that's what i want sure to do. but I'm, I'm i'm trying to learn how yeah see on this one the lightning just comes out of the earpieces 
I love it. Okay. That's good to know. That that helps. And I might not even know. No, see, I didn't quite do it here. I had the best first drawing I did for the cover thing. I had the wing thing kind of becoming the electric flow of all that stuff. And here mm -hmm. I didn't have the electric flow coming off of his belt and everything in the ultimate fashion that I wound up doing. This was earlier, clunky of version. Right, right, right. How I do you do pro after this? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Got it. So if uh th this is much later um uh but the ear pieces and stuff are the same but this one and mm -hmm. one of these other ones should be a better shot for showing um how the lightning went i it wound up i think maybe coming off of the belt piece that they had had devised at that time right which was different than barry so it wasn't just the regular jagged lines of the lightning it was that bigger arc uh um coming from the center of his uh, pants um, gotcha. that would then spark out from that. That gave me a, the idea so that all of those lightning things going on in the background that I used for Flash. Let's see if there's another. Um, yeah, but this is still early on. This is a little bit clunky. This isn't quite whipping around as much. What right. I want to do later, and it's sort of coming here, was that it was much more arcing and like the 3d effects that i would try to use on the flash the lightning that was coming off of him i wanted to really have as much motion and life to it as possible mm -hmm. so it would whip around kind of like water arcing sparking around but then also oh. like lightning, so it, would, it would really add to the whole fluidity of the whole thing interesting okay so then instead of what i have you care to these yeah i got gotcha. you okay so I would have to I make like all the much, blur on that second panel too. Scott's so really great. Make much more of a zigzaggy flow. Zigzaggy and not repetitive, not the same zigzaggy. Right. So let me see if I can. Like a heart attack, Jeff, not a heartbeat. Okay. Like, yes, exactly. Um, so gotcha. that it would be. Gotcha. You would pick and choose your start and stops of which would be a big arc and a little arc, um, but they would work kind of in tandem and rhythm together, kind of thing. To hey Scott, uh, can you leave that up for? Hang on, I know mean, I know you're talking, but okay, okay, I think I have a good idea of it. Okay, let me do, let me copy that straight up. Right. But then I would arc it too, Jeff. Yeah, like you're doing there. You either arc forward pushing yeah. toward flash or arc backward depending on what I'm doing with it or how I felt about it. I got you. Okay. Excellent. I mean, it would actually go into the science of the fact that um, I had to make a decision. Okay, cool. I, I think it was random because I saw it done both ways of like the lightning bolts that were on flash's arms. When you look at them, are the points pointed in towards his body or pointed out away from his body? Right. Um, you know, which way the lightning is actually uh, rotating on the costume. And I picked uh, rotating out, at least for the top line, Forgot because it. that to me was expansive for the flash. Um, but I reversed it for uh, reverse flash for zoom so that his arcs, his lightning shape and this one were reversed the other way. So now when you did reverse flash or zoom, did, did you create that character or did you design that guy? Well, how'd that work out? I did. Um, that's one of my uh, big feathers in my cap. Uh, Jeff told me from the beginning, Jeff Johns, that uh, he had this whole plan for Hunter Zolomon and um, bringing him into the book, making him Barry, uh, Wally's friend and all that stuff, um, a part of the police force and whatnot, and that he was eventually going to be um, empowered and um, become Wally's giant nemesis um, of the whole story. And uh, in the making of that, yeah, then Jeff said, okay, but we want to make them, you know, like Flash, reverse Flash off the basic design of Flash stuff, but then, you know, twist it, come up with some other thing to it. Um, and the eye pieces uh, da, 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 here, um, the eye pieces and the real push uh, uh, sharper angle on the parts of the costume that had come across through his cheeks to his mouth. Yeah. Um, I was just telling this at the con in um, Utrecht that um, most is honestly the idea for those, for his eyepieces there and the, the shape of the, the flaps over his cheeks um, to, uh, to accentuate it, make it more evil than flash has. But really the, the other impetus behind it was that I'm such an old fan of G force and battle of the planets 
that eye shape and those shapes coming down off of the eye and over the cheeks and whatnot just came naturally as something that I'm remembering, I think, from uh, G-Force and all the bad guys they used to have on that show. I can see that. I can see the Gotchman influence there. Yeah. Uh, but yes, then I did uh, do the whole basic design for uh, Zoom here, who was supposed to be different than Reverse Flash. He wasn't just supposed to be like phone. Um, and I do know if I thought you had one up here but I don't know if I put a good one up. Um, the big deal for Zoom, which has now changed the whole scenario of what everybody does for Reverse Flash or Zoom, because they both have, have it now. Um, is the inverted chest symbol? Yeah, I reversed yeah. the chest symbol. Um, and I wasn't even 100% aware of how much I was doing it at the time or not, because as you guys know, when I'm drawing something, I'll draw it on the front, and yeah. then I'll flip it over, see it through a light box, fix my errors, draw it again, flip it over, Draw it again, flip it over, draw it again, right. uh, trying to fix things and make it the best drawing that I can make it. And who knows, you know, which flip of the drawing it was when I finished the um, Zoom design. But I had ultimately, the one I said to Jeff uh, that we picked through and then we picked was the one where it reversed a symbol. Where in the old books and Infantino and everything previous, even through um, Greg LaRocque or I don't think Ringo ever drew reverse flash he might have but um up to that point uh their symbols had been going in the same direction it was just a matter of the coloring that told you which one was flash and which one was reverse flash interesting and i had actually flipped it so zoom symbol on the chest is a mirror is a backwards reverse image of uh wally's or barry's um chest symbol um and Jeff just lost his mind when I handed him that in and he saw that it was actually reversed. He's like, oh my God, that's right. so perfect. I can't believe no one's done that before. This is the best thing ever. Well, so what you're saying is that you didn't necessarily plan that, but it you after drawing it for a while, it sort of popped up. And you're like, oh yeah, that looks awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it popped in as one of the ideas for the putting it together. And I had no idea that I'd actually, you know, done something that was that worthwhile um putting the putting it together for that uh that character who is such a mainstay for the um the flash book in general he is the most popular flash villain so i would describe that as a very happy accident yes yeah very um and it's influential now at this point which is weird i always think of it for zoom but now it doesn't matter if it's tv movie whatever else going on if it's reverse flash anything Right. Um, all of them are done that way now. All of them have the flipped um, chest symbol. Well, it's one of those things where it's it seems so obvious in hindsight, but right. no one had done it before. Yep. Yeah. It's one of those things. <clears throat> so then one of the other things that came from Flash stuff, which you had some of the pieces up here, um, was not only the running, but then other ways to be showing the action. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, wait, before we get to that, this was one of the other hallmarks of initially my flash run. Oh, wait, there's the other one down here. I forgot those in order. Nope. Maybe I didn't put them in yet. Are um, you in the background there? Uh, yeah. The One of the things I had decided on earlier, there were two different um, kind of rules, or three different rules now in mind when I was working on flash stuff. That Number one, I would either blur the flash and have the background solid and readable or i would blur the background and show the flash right which these couple of panels show um the the difference of the two it depends on what i wanted out of the book uh, but obviously most of the time it was going to be that flash was going to be there visible and the backgrounds would be blurred right um i think that's what uh fans or kids or whatnot would respond to more than um, a blurred image of him um with a clean background it worked a couple times but well, it's, um, it's nice because it's a little bit reminiscent of, you know, like when those guys did Quicksilver in Days of Future Past and uh, X-Men Apocalypse, you know, where if you're seeing something from the point of view of the super speed character, you know, like, I feel like what you're doing there is kind of a little bit of an approximation of what it, because it wouldn't really work very well or very interestingly, I think in a comic that much to do like the whole stop time freeze frame thing that they did in those movies. You know what I mean? Right. Like you could do it here and there, but I feel like 
the blurred backgrounds is kind of an interesting similar approximation, I think. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, you're right. I mean, it changes for the point of view of stuff because I was used to also previous to that anything at Marvel with Quicksilver going in. Quicksilver was often a bad guy or some sort of um, uh, not trustworthy person or whatever. So a lot of times when you're seeing him, um, he was blurred, uh, especially when you go back to the uh, Kirby stuff with the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants or whatever. Right. Um, he would often draw him in just that blurred thing. That's the only way he handled his speed. Um, but that does make him a mysterious thing, which you can do. And I did at times on Flash stuff, but it was usually the other characters are on Flash, not usually Flash himself, because um, he yeah. usually, Jeff didn't write him in that way to give off that demeanor that he was spooky or, um, you know, not corporal kind of a thing. It was usually yeah. the straightforward, hi, I'm Wally West, the good guy. Um, but yeah, one of the things I had to do in there often was... Um, the violence, the clash of stuff, the giant kabang of punches, that kind of thing. <clears throat> and honestly, most of these things that I learned all around during on the flash time, or even maybe a little before, um, I would carry on into other books and other things um, for how they would work. And it's similar to the action that you're trying to draw on that um, flash running pose or anything that's in comics um, where you've heard those rules. What's the rule where... Um, the more you can separate like the limbs of a body, the more action it has. Right. The, the, the more extreme it feels, the faster it feels like it's going and the more powerful it feels. Right. How many, that's such a great shot, Scott. Two, that's a double page spread or is that just a big panel? No, it's a two page spread. Yeah. Yeah. That's look great. at that. Look at that kick. The, the, the flexing of the heel. Oh, <laughs> so how, brutal. how many issues of the flash did you end up doing would you say scott Ooh, uh <clears throat> i've had kind of basically two runs on flash the initial time with jeff and then <clears throat> um just a couple of years ago i did kind of a year's worth off and on um with uh, josh joshua williamson but i was one of the rotating artists on that run <clears throat> um but still i did it for off and on for about a year there. So you could be, and the fill-ins and, and different things I've done, uh, Flash Blackest Night, um, different things. You could be looking at like, I don't know, some 60 issues, maybe 70 issues of Flash stuff. That's pretty All amazing. Right. Just, just as a quick side note, I'm going to say that what I did, what I did for the lightning there in the legs, it's too much. I went too far. Like it's not, it's not uniform. It doesn't, it doesn't flow like the stuff that you had flow. Well, I mean, you, everybody winds up uh, bringing their own voice to it of what they're going to do. Um, yeah. There are tons yeah. of guys who do really cool electric stuff or whatever on Flash stuff that I don't do. So Jeff, just, I, think, I think it's maybe just the top one once you're, when you're getting the hang of it. Like, I think the, the right. bottom four are all pretty great. And then the top one, right, like I would just, if we, you know, in the computer, I just take a couple of them out so that it so that it was. Uh, well, uh, in hindsight, one of the things I think the Scott's rhythm, I don't know if he's doing it on purpose or not, but one of the things I just noticed having drawn it and then I'll go ahead and say failed. But it's OK. You learn more from falling down than standing up. Right. Like I think there's a rhythm to Scott's lightning. Right. Like almost as though there's steps in it. And I didn't, I didn't catch that. Right. And I'm also trying for bigger arcs and little arcs and different things like that to either yeah. help with the power punch or the, um, or even just the, the, that running of a pose. Right. Um, right. Because you almost, even on that uh, profile of a shot, I think of that you almost have to kind of, um, in the, in, in fact that it's a comic book and it's just the one shot, but we have to uh, multi-layered in a way of thinking that it's many shots in a shot. I okay. think of even a thing like that, doing it like the Millennium Falcon when they do on Star Wars, in mm -hmm. that in the reality of a comic book, you could say that it's just this profile shot kind of or three-quarter shot of the Millennium Falcon cruising along past those asteroids. But you'd almost in this, uh, a really good comic book, you'd have to infer the fact that, you know, the Millennium Falcon started here amongst the asteroids right and came in did this yeah and then came out again and back in the sea so you have that real push of everything going on so i would try and do that with the lightning or the different uh poses i would pick that's where i'd get 
um, the real extreme 3D stuff. That was one of the big things I'd done. I hadn't done it by the time I'd done this cover. There's a little bit of in there, but right. see, this is actually much more related to that pose. I noticed that Infantino's feet there were right. bigger than the head. So I'm like, oh, he's dragging you down to street level. Um, you know, the, the feet and the boots and he's running, those are the most important parts. Okay, that makes sense. Right. Um, so then I would try and play that up in some of the things I was doing. Um, but it, it, it grew into more than that, even the lightning on here. But again, this isn't the best lightning. But I've, I've heard here some uh, fellow artists and people I've worked with talk about, you know, playing with the Z axis, right? Like not just having your drawings exist on the X and Y axis, but. Um, absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, trying to um, throw in as much 3D or whatnot as possible. Yeah, that's Jeff, pretty... Jeff knows that too, like in storyboarding or something of like, oh, you're having characters enter from, like Scott's running shot's a perfect example right there. Like rather than having him run in from the side, he's running into the shot, you know, yeah. so that. Um... Right, right. No, it's really, it's really interesting because I definitely, you know, I've studied Scott's stuff for a long time and Scott and I have been friends forever and I'm a huge fan of his work, but it wasn't until I tried to deconstruct what he was doing and then not getting it and then being like, uh oh, wait a minute. That Did I do this at a con too sometime where you were starting a drawing of a flash thing and then I played with it a little over your pencils or something like that and then you finished inked it or something? I can't remember. Probably. I want to say we did something like that too. Yeah, yeah. Now see, this was me trying to play with different stuff. I had seen more people around this time where they were still keeping the lightning looking like lightning so it was doing the that Z pattern all over the place. Right. Um, I kind of like that fine, but I kind of don't. So what what then would be this the second Scott secret that the lightning itself has almost a, a fourth dimensional quality to it, showing where he's been, uh, where he's been, or again inviting the reader to um, you know experience that speed force thing as a uh, in your face um, uh, drawing you into the whole experience and not necessarily um, just something you're witnessing at face value, you know, in uh, at a medium shop. Now, important uh, listeners and uh, artists and fellow artists or aspiring artists, you don't have to just try to draw a convincing illusion of three dimensions, but if you're Jeff Johnson, you're worrying about four <laughs> dimensions. <laughs> yeah, well, I and, mean. And not just when you're drawing Mixius Piddly. Yeah, yes. <laughs> He's, uh, isn't he fifth dimensional? Oh, uh, uh, my apologies. Yeah, I believe he is a fifth dimensional. <laughs> But oh. by the way, kudos on pronouncing his name correctly. I have never been able to do that. It's only because I worked on Superman the Animated Cartoon and heard people like Paul Dini saying it. So it's like, oh, that's how you say it. Okay. Yeah. Say it again, Steve. Mixius Pitalik. Yeah. Yeah. Never, never in my life have I been able to close to that. <laughs> While we're all having our drinks, by the way, I brought this other drink that I wanted to have. Are we ready? What is that? Yeah, but it's actually a sea drink. Oh, it's vitamin C. In there. Yeah. Well, you did just get back from traveling, so you have time. Yeah. Uh, what else we got? Um, so there was the blurring of the background or the blurring of flash. There was Ooh, the lighting a, I used. That's a great effect. That yeah. Um. Yeah. Speaking of cartoon examples, I feel like I'd be remiss if we do a show about the Flash and not talking about. So, Jeff and I have both have had the uh, boss Sean Negagosian. He's my current boss on Kung Fu Panda Dragon Knight, and he also just produced this amazing show on Netflix called uh, Blood of Zeus that came out, I think, last year. It's so good. He, he was uh, Jeff's director on Transformers Prime, but back when he was just a lowly storyboard artist. Um, he was working for the genius director, Joaquin Dos Santos, who's now, I believe, uh, he's a giant, giant, giant important part of Legend of Korra and uh, Avatar The Last Airbender. And he's currently uh, one of the directors on the new uh, Spider-Verse uh, sequel that they're doing. But he directed an episode of Justice League Unlimited, which of course is produced by Bruce Timm. Um, and... Uh, in the season finale of all of the Just League Unlimited, Shant storyboarded the sequence where like 
I think Luther has like taken on all the powers of like everybody and stuff. And so the flash has to literally like run around the entire earth to build up uh, speed. I wish that um, I'd oh, been cool. able to get, get you copies of some of the storyboards, but oh, yeah, so who are those? Sean storyboarded a pretty legendary scene involving the flash where basically the flash saved the, the day in the end and did some just, stuff. yeah, some pretty, it's like, wait, so flash is running around the earth. I guess that's kind of like Superman and a Superman one, but yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> All right, so what else? Well, Scott, let me ask you a super nerdy question. Yeah. How fast were you thinking the fat the flash was going? Like because I know that he during the Bruce uh the Butch Geis era, he his top speed was like the speed of sound. That's right. right. They they left yeah, they to to pull back from the cosmic tread still treadmill flash can run through time. They, they thought like, let's humanize him and limit his speed so that it's still, and that was a really interesting era and an interesting challenge to kind of give the character, I think at that time. Oh no, I love, I love that. I love that, the li not liability, but restraint almost. But Scott like- And remember he had to eat all that food too. Oh, that's yeah, right, to, that's right. He yeah. had to get the calories in for sure. Yep. What uh? How, so what's your what was your your flash's speed like? What, what how would you think of it? Uh, that was another actual. Let me go back to the other piece. One of the other things I had done at this time was um, I don't know if I'd say this would have been at his peak here, um, but one of the things that I had done at that time, and I tried to continue it through when I did um, even as a guest artist on Flash stuff, was these yellow panel borders. Mm. When yeah. I was doing Flash stuff. Um, every time uh, Flash was doing or Wally was doing a thing um, and it was super speed and here he's uh, reading some books at super speed. Uh, Jeff did that a couple times where he was going to speed read something like know how to build a car and then he'd wow. see super speed build a car and then he'd say that the way the powers worked was that if, uh, gradually within a day or two he'd wind up forgetting that information like he had speed tested kind of thing. But the short, the short um, memory was just a little bit longer but faster right that kind of a thing but it also gave it so that you know wally could be like an, an expert at anything you wanted to do if you wanted to build a building with the raw materials or help out or whatever you could do he could do all these amazing things and yet it gave it that limitation that he couldn't do just do anything for the fun of it right um, you, couldn't, you couldn't be forever know how to play piano right um but in here in these sequences and i did it often well throughout the rest of my time on the series was i would put these yellow borders in whenever i thought he was in flash time and he wasn't in normal time with everybody else. Oh, that's mm. interesting. And so you just thought of it as flash time? Yeah. Did you ever tell anyone that? I think I told Jeff that, yeah. That it was, you know, well, it was my idea that whenever he was in super speed, uh, well, I mean, and we all got this from hearing Alan Moore or whatever mention that stuff in Swamp Thing of like, you know, the, the world for the flash is just a world of statues. Right. As compared to him. Um, that always, that kind of stuff always stuck with me going like, oh, right. For you know, for the rest of us around him, we're not moving, we're not doing stuff. When he slips into super speed or um, speed force or any of these things, then he's just on a completely different time level uh, right. than the rest of us. Yeah, yeah. So I would sense. often use that as a marker, but it also would let. Uh, I think we talked about it at the time with Jeff and I that um, it was a marker to let you know us know and the fans know when Flash was pouring it on and doing things at a certain speed. And one times he wasn't. In fact, I want to say it was our fourth issue when things really started to uh, click for both of us that um, I may have even gotten this idea from Jeff. I think I drew it in before then, but um, or maybe it was our conversations during this time, but he had a page where um, it was great. Uh, Wally and Linda were there and Linda's parents were visiting his house and he was having an uncomfortable conversation with Linda's dad. Mm -hmm. um, something about the fact that he needed to be saving money for the future and what about kids and whatever different married life things of the conversation was going on talking to your father-in-law. Um, sure. But that uh, Wally admitted that he was actually, there was a piece of his mind that was skipping about all this stuff. So he was turning on the speed force, even though he was in this conversation. And, um, and Jeff wrote like the guy's dialogue slowing down uh. as Wally was getting in that mode. And then uh, Wally also looked over at the TV and then saw um, 
Captain Cold or whoever it was, the villain that was on TV, that then drew on for the rest of the story. But there was that whole like division between normal speed or flash and then flash speed stuff. So that was another marker of where I tried to always have uh, uh, the fast and slow of whatever was happening on the page of the panels, that there was normal time and then, yeah, there was flash time. One of the things I love about that story is that that I don't know. We've all done comics for so long that it, that it's it's tricky to think about had you not been given that time to figure it out, right? Like if if you guys had not been given a year or whatever to get good at doing the Flash, you might never have come across that. Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, thank you, Leon. That's exactly yeah. What uh, you remembering the the sequence that I was talking about. Um, uh, I've mentioned a couple times since then, uh, or Jeff and I have talked about this since then, that um, we were lucky as part of this earlier time frame, like you and I have talked about, Jeff, of uh, being in comics at this time and earlier in the 90s, or even obviously if we would have been in the 80s, um, that there was this uh, maturation that was allowed uh, right. during yeah. this time when you're able to get on a book where it could take you four or six issues to really get your uh footing <laughs> right. um, uh, nice on being on a book or or to hit your stride <laughs> <laughs> tune in every week folks for this yeah I'm, I'm here i'm here every week oh so we bad. keep going <laughs> all right keep up keep, keep, keep the pace moving good, it's a good way of being a flash in the pan oh god <laughs> all right you um, so yeah it. absolutely uh, and i talked to uh, Jeff Johns about this at that, that sometime later. And Jeff said that we were completely lucky that we got that at this time. He goes, nowadays, that wouldn't happen. Right. It, it would not be allowed to happen at all for us. And we found our own place, you know, with the book. We didn't, uh, there wasn't so much interference or rules about what to do, and what not to do, or, or fixing us or any of those sort of things. And I think there's a bunch of that that's involved um, since then of, um, you know, there's almost uh, sometimes maybe uh, more editorial controls in place than there are, or there were it, when we were. It might be one of the last times I can really remember it happening. You know, like, like it, it was already, I mean, it definitely wouldn't have happened now, but it was right at the end of it being able to happen even 20 years ago. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, as, and again, as that singular team, um, I liked what Joshua Williamson did with uh, the various creators he had at the start of, this would have been Rebirth Flash. Um, but even right from the get-go, because they made it a uh, bi-weekly book, that they had two or three ar artistic creative teams in there. And you're just not going to get that unison of a team when you've got three art teams and a writer and, and different stuff like that going. Um, got, you're going to get different takes. we got three very interesting, uh, very different comments out here. <laughs> One is Leon Glazer just brings up, seeing something that said the flash couldn't watch TV because he'd sit through every frame rendering one line at a time. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, Peerless loser says a mullet verse possibility. What if flash Thompson was the flash? That is definitely an interesting idea. Um, and then I think a question that I am interested in hearing Scott's answer to is, Hey Scott, out of the flash robes, is there any flash villain in particular you've enjoyed drawing over any of the other robes? I, I, I suspect I know the answer to this question. I think but, I know the answer. I think I've probably talked about it enough to you guys that you should probably know. <laughs> I, I don't think we even have to. I don't think we even have to do that. I think we just know what you like and we know what you draw. Right. So, Jeff, should we just say it on the count of three? Obviously, it's Captain Cold. Oh, I, I would have thought it was Begrod. It's a it's giant Grodd. ape. Yeah, it's Grod. Grod. Oh, but you've done so much great cold stuff. I know you love him so much. I do a great cold, and I, I was totally, um, my Captain Cold was totally informed by two things, um, really, the Michael Golden shot that he did from Who's Who, right? Mm. Um, and then um, Jeff talking about him and, and explaining uh, what Captain Cold meant for him, because Jeff's favorite Flash villain was Captain Cold, mm. um, or is Captain Cold. So uh, it was the combination of those two, and him explaining who Captain Cold was to me. Um, that then informed my Captain Cold drawing so that they were, um, you know, all that they could be. Well, Jeff, and I Jeff, do love drawing them, and I drew them a lot, but... Um, but you no, know that Joe is 100% right. No, no, Jeff, I'm not surprised that you went there because when I first read Matt's question, my first thought went there because I thought about the fact that Jeff 
and Jeff and Scott did so much with Leonard Snart. Am I correct? Yeah. Did I just pull that out? You did very well. <laughs> thank yep. you. Yeah, nice job, Jones. <laughs> um, and uh, thank you, thank you. And um, <laughs> and I got. I mean, and I also got to briefly say, you know, Flash's Rogues Gallery is right up there. You know, it's like a great Rogues Gallery. Batman and Spider Man. I think you know it's probably eternal argument between Marvel and DC fans and people that are dumb enough to think there's a Marvel. DC rivalry, right? But I, I think it's probably fair to say that those are the two best rogues galleries out there. Yeah. But, then, uh, but I think you know, Flash is—he's definitely the silver medal that rogues gallery. And I think the term rogues gallery kind of came out of his rogues gallery. Like, absolutely. I feel like that was the first place I ever heard that term, and then it kind of got adapted into being used as it relates to Batman and and. Uh, and Spider-Man too. I mean, plenty of characters have great ones. I think the fan Fantastic Four has a totally doesn't get the credit it deserves for how great their rogues gallery is. But I think um, right, Fantastic but, Four has an amazing. I mean, honestly, Doctor Doom, Annihilus, Galactus. I mean, Fantastic Four has a crazy good rogues gallery. Yeah, no, but I, I think, but so I totally get why you because my first thought did go to like, wow, Jeff and Jeff Johns and. Scott did so much with Captain Cold, but then I'm like, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, you know, you're right. There's I, a, there's I'm, a I'm giant right. talking ape. I'm 100% wrong. The, the rod is obviously. <laughs> if, if, right, if, if Scott could, if DC would call Scott tomorrow to say, would you like to just draw a Gorilla Grodd miniseries? Or I mean, oh. you know, like on, ongoing series. I think that might be one of the, that would make Jeff ha Scott, Scott happier than drawing Superman. Or That's money. That would be money in the bank. Can you imagine, Steve? Let's just for a moment fantasize Gorilla Grodd and Solomon Grundy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a really good point. Yeah. That would be a good one. That'd or be a, good, that'd or be a, a DC, good book right a DC there. Marvel crossover with Hulk and the Thing versus uh, Grundy oh, and Grodd. There you go. That's so tasty. With with everyone teleporting everywhere with Lockjaw. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You have a happy Scott. Oh my lord! I, I think I'm going to faint. Yeah, yeah. That's that's. We may we may have to pay Scott. We may have to commission him for this drawing. Well, I, I certainly know what I'm asking for my birthday. Well, how? In Jesus. fact, here this is part of that first Grod issue we did, um, and Grod was uh, Grod was something I wanted to do. I think Jeff probably would have done Grod at some point anyway. But I was the one who was really pushing for Grodd to get back in the book. Um, and we had to convince DC at the time. They did not want us to do a Grodd issue. But we're like, no, no, this isn't going to be the silly JLA ape thing or whatever that had been going on before. Um, this is going to be a terrifying King Kong monster that's going to scare the crap out of people. Yeah. Uh, so, so this was the two-page spread at the end of the thing where uh, Jeff, asked, Jeff Johns asked me to draw... He wanted me to draw the whole uh, top-down city view of where Grodd had landed at the end and been defeated and stopped, and also going back to where he had started his destruction, where he'd been kind of rampaging through the city. Right. Rampage. Exactly. One of the things, uh, it, what's crazy about that perspective, that shot, Scott, is just how epic it is. Like, the, the perspective is bananas. Um, it leads the eye so beautifully. Now, when... How did and it all points to the unconscious grot on the floor in the center of the oh yeah, no, it's street. perfect with the with the X marks the spot of the streets. Yep. Oh, it's yep. genius. Now, what did Jeff what did Jeff write for that scene? He wrote that he wanted this two-page spread at the end that was supposed to show Grod unconscious now, and then he probably thought it was gonna be more of a level angle. Right. Uh that was gonna show a little bit of down the street or whatever and some broken buildings or something like that. But he wanted to show, um, you know, where Grodd had come to crash now, um, and then uh, a little bit of the carnage behind him of all the city, uh, the cars that he'd uh, busted up and the buildings he'd broken up, that sort of thing. Because we'd done page after page after page of him whipping around cars and throwing cars into buildings and all sorts of stuff. Um, so this was the thing at the end of it where um, Jeff and I were completely in sync about this, where we just wanted, again, Grodd to be this complete badass monster that was supposed to scare people. Right. He wrote uh, this one panel in the middle of this book that I still uh, keep bringing up to him from time to time to time where we have to do this story. I don't think we'll ever do it. But, um, he mentions this idea that uh, on an earlier battle where Barry had fought Grodd in the timeline of the fictional DC universe, that... Uh, Wally would have been around as Kid Flash as the young Kid Flash, who was what, 
12, 14, whatever he was back then. Sure. Um, uh, uh, Jeff threw in this line about, you know, the first time I met him as, you know, the young kid flash and I was 12 or whatever, you know, he scared the crap out of me. I just saw this giant, you know, angry gorilla um, that looked vicious as, as all hell. Um, and he threw this just, it, I'm rewarding it badly, but he had this great, like one caption box that explained all that stuff. I'm like, oh, that's such a great story to tell. We have to tell that story sometime of this 10 year old or whatever, uh, Wally West coming around the corner thinking, Hey, I'm kid flash. I'm having fun. I can And you skid around the corner and, you know, coming face to face with this giant, you know, 10 foot, whatever tall gorilla, um, frothing gorilla, just scaring the crap out of him being something from your nightmares. Oh yeah. He's, he should be frightening. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's what we tr continued to try and do anytime we were showing him after this too, was the idea that, even though Wally's grown up now and um, all of that, that, whatever we see of him or the fans should see of him, uh, Grodd should just look like something completely nightmarish. Right. Uh, the other big thing that I usually did, um, and this was part of it for Flash Duff, was um, uh, very different from your Vera pose, but uh, always trying to push the 3D aspect of the running poses as much as I could. Right. Mm. And this is something I even want to talk about with uh, Kevin Nolan. Um, when I saw him at that con a couple of years back where um, he was being very nice and uh, complimenting me on the fact that I'm able to do all these 3D shots and yet they come off, you know, usually fairly fluid and natural and all that. He thought that was one of my best aspects of working on the Flash stuff was the fluidity and the naturalness, even though I'm doing these exaggerated 3D poses and stuff. Um, th but that was one of my, I think... Uh, regular tools of the trade that I would pull out to make stuff work. Even in a, a, a slightly more um, calm fashion like this, um, when you look at uh, Barry's figure on the left, his head size versus his feet size on the bottom, I try and throw a fair amount of depth in there in those running poses so that you always get this feeling that, uh, like we said at the beginning, that he's not even almost necessarily touching the ground with half that stuff. He's just right. propelled along. Mm. Speaking of drawing, Dave Righteous has a good question for you, Scott. Scott, your camera angles and perspective mastery are incredible. We agree. Any yeah. secrets on how you learn to draw from up and down angles so well? Besides chapter two of how to draw comics the marble way. <laughs> I was about right. to say, uh, most of that would have been from those uh, perspective books or things. Um, the only thing that, that came to me um, about my uh, choosing of those shots uh, would have just been the idea of, well, uh, two things. One, that first interview that I had with Archie Goodwin, where I had um, in my sample pages at that point, camera angles all over the place. Every panel was a, an extreme camera angle of up, down, behind, mm -hmm. around, whatever I was doing. Um, and Archie looked at those pages and goes, I don't know what the hell's going on with half these panels. You got to slow this down. You got to do a lot more calm mm -hmm. shots Right. Um, to tell the story of what's going on. And then you pull out the extreme top down or the extreme bottom up or something like that shot or a fish eye or some sort of crazy lens thing. There you go, Jeff. Now you're starting to get it where you're getting the flow of right. different lightning going on. Well, I'm sorry. I started to, I, I noticed that you have the wide streaks, but then also you throw in a little lightning, a little small lightning connective sparks almost. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, so Archie was the one that explained to me going like, well, save your fancy stuff uh, for when you want a fancy moment kind of a thing. Um, and uh, then it was, you know, the other stuff that they would, we talked about at the Cooper school where the top downs would make you more um, omnipotent and more godly uh, looking down on everybody else kind of a thing. And the shots up uh, would make you um, the opposite of that would make you, uh, childlike or would make the what you're viewing much more ominous. Um, right. But, you know, I think, besides, I think back to Dave's question, because I think, Scott, you're going to the psychology of using shots like that. But I think even just the fact that Archie Goodwin had to restrain you, you know, and the fact that your brain kind of naturally goes that way, I think it's probably far more common for a lot of artists to struggle with extreme angles and extreme things and to tend to draw stuff from more eye level and the places and the way that they see the world. And I think, I mean, I guess 
your answer to his question is there's nothing particularly sexy. It's just the meticulous rules of learning the, the rules of, of perspective and, and, and learning how to do particularly a three point perspective where, which you can get the basics from, um, you know, from how to draw comics the Marvel way. This, there's, a, there's a lot of good books out there. I actually got one that I've been looking at again recently is a perspective made, made easy by Ernest Norling is a really good. Oh yeah. That's a great book. It, it's cheap. Oh, nice. It's an old classic and it just, and it, um, and it just, right. I mean, there's just, I, I think, I think right. We're all of us are always looking for, for those shortcuts what's the secret to drawing great anatomy what's the secret to drawing you know all these all this you know but i think the secret to drawing the basics is just to sort of boringly and meticulously learn the rules associated with those basic things you know yeah it's drawing it over and over again it's practicing and all that stuff over and over again um, um similar to the perspective of uh, backgrounds or different things like that would be this shot of um this blackest night um, Zoom, I guess it was, yeah. Um, that, you know, I'd wind up picking the head size, then the body size, and I'd wind up, you know, redrawing this over and over again to make sure that the feet got small enough or the hands got big enough or that mm -hmm. the elbow midpoint, you know, between the giant hand size and the body size or his head size would uh, mathematically sort of uh, match in there so that I was telegraphing um, all that you needed to telegraph so that you understood what was going on with the 3d of this uh shot of the figure or you know when you're doing with any of the stuff with the car or anything else i mean you can always warp it even more with a wor uh, worm's eye or a fish eye view which gives very little uh eye uh, it gives little information for the eye to understand how the perspective is working when you do those extreme angles but when i was doing stuff like this i would always trying to like give the eye enough information each piece along the way so that you'd see the railroad track that was closest to you that was huge and a big uh, V fashion. And then you'd see the railroad tracks as they would go back and it would all make sense of why you're looking at something in perspective. Right. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, <clears throat> but before we wrap up, we're getting about an hour. Um, I took a lot of the stuff that I learned from Flash and the dynamics and the action, all that kind of stuff. And I put them on a lot of other books that I'd worked on like oh, here for that's a great great shot yeah i love that one yeah so you did a you did avengers earth's mightiest heroes after flash yep this was after flash stuff um this would have been learning all those spectre perspective things i'm doing all the shots that i've done on keystone and central city great great shot because even i mean as ma as much of a master of both figure drawing and perspective as john Buscema is i don't feel like he did a lot of shots like this of goliath you know what i mean like he right he was more inclined to just pull the camera back. I mean, he would draw Goliath in surrounded by everyone else. That was, you know, like Goliath was always very consistently in that world, but he very, but I don't feel like there's a lot of this forced angle on Goliath, you know? No. Yeah, you're right. Uh, Basemo, I think would usually just change the perspective on the backgrounds around him. So he'd shrink the room that, Goliath was in, but Goliath was essentially just a giant figure of the kind of figures he'd drawn on and the other panels. Yeah. Um, or he'd have just the giant hand, like a King Kong hand coming in through the window. So you'd have the giant hand there. Right. Um, but even in that, yes, no, the um, he wouldn't necessarily force, force the perspective too much. Um, and there's another shot where, again, I was just trying to make sure that all the 3D stuff was lining up and working. But one of the things about this and what I think worked for Flash Stuff and other things that have worked since then was to pick the other shots in here that weren't then forced perspective, that weren't um, uh, necessarily that fluid or whatever. This was supposed to be a stable stock shot. That's a um, great, great shot. Thanks, man. Uh, yeah, um, I, I think one. actually I was critiqued at this one. I don't think the Marvel guys were happy with this page. What? Um, what? what? Nonsense. Well, again, it's one of those things where, uh, you know, the... Um, the fail safe button when you do a shot like this or whatever of the, of the people being there is to pull out a lot of the stops. I mean, this was supposed to be a payoff panel of the page or right. payoff, uh, a whole page of the book. Um, so that, you know, they might've put the camera angle much more down by Captain America's feet. So it was much more 3d of how you saw Captain America and much more imposing than if he was looking over you and all that kind of stuff. Right. Um, 
but there were several times during flash stuff that um uh where i was learning of where you would um how you would use again like archie talked about when to use those fantastic shots and not fantastic shots and on this avenger shot it was important to me for all the other things that were going on in the story that this was just going to be them straightforward. I thought they'd look amazing enough in this almost stagnant kind of shot that later on when I was, it was during the She-Hulk story that you'd save the dramatic and whatnot shots um, uh, for the later stuff that was going to go on with She-Hulk, the more emotional shots and that kind of right. stuff. Yeah, that's a great. Uh, Mighty Triceradog, does Scott use models for those shots that are extremely foreshortened? I can answer that question. Scott draws, uh, having shared a studio with him, I've never seen Scott actually use a model. Like, I think he draws entirely from his uh, twisted little imagination. He's very annoying that way. Most of it is. Um, I mean, there were plenty of times in the past where as I was working on all of these things that I was, you know, looking at myself in a mirror or um, looking at different shots I could find in magazines and that kind of stuff. But more often than not, yeah, it was me doing trial and error, drawing these kind of poses over and over and over again um, until they would finally work. Mostly yeah, so, that's, why, that's why I have lots of pictures of Scott, but Scott has no pictures of me. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. Well, no, actually, I do. I have a couple of pictures of you. I did use you. Just when Jeff was sleeping, but that's sure, totally sure. different. It's totally different, Scott. <laughs> no, no, no. Wait, what, so um, what, what did I pose for? I want to say I had you pose. I know I had you pose when we were in that Wells Fargo building. So it might have been for Green Lantern stuff uh -huh. um, or something else. I can't remember. That's like really the time of the Kyle Rayner thing. I might have gotcha. used it as a uh, model for some of this stuff. Last yeah. week or the week before, Scott, me and Jeff talked about that it would be fun to do. Uh, uh, oh, that's a great, great Kyle Rayner shot, Scott. Of, um, yeah, that's awesome. I, I remember that one. That's a great shot. Gang by Klaus Jansen. Yeah, he, you guys are a great team. Do do a do a panel by panel thing of Blood Wolf versus Supreme. Have Dan on the show and also show all the photo reference that Jeff. You know, you basically played Blood Wolf for that episode, and I basically for that issue, and I basically <laughs> played Supreme. And there's, yeah. there, there'd be fun to see the photo next to Jeff. You know, Jeff doing such a great job of just using us as like you know a jumping off point, and then putting all that great. Um, yeah. That was good times. Well, it's, I mean, it's, I mean, learning how to draw is a, a never ending process. Yep. No, I just, I, you know, I just took a bunch of pictures of myself acting out a Poe monologue the other day, you know. Great. Um, so again, I was using a lot of that stuff I'd learned from Flash, even here with this action. Um, yeah. It has a lot of speed to it as I'm doing the multiple um, uh, shots of his, this, uh, bad guy's kind of fist or whatever he has uh, smacking down on King Shark. But I do oh, this, no. you know, all the stuff that's in here, the speed lines in the sky, the multiple angles of the fist coming down, the way the water's, see how the water's going even, uh, Jeff? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, Those it's beautiful. Arcs, it's curved. It's beautiful. A lot of that still, that's learned from doing the lightning on Flash stuff. Yeah, I mean, that, I mean, it's it's an interesting use of almost, we would describe that as a banana pan in animation as right. you know, right, right, yeah. Right. yeah awesome <clears throat> and even shots like this again the very 3d thing going on um a lot of that came out of flash stuff That's you learned how to piece it together there oh look at that yeah i mean one of the things i really like about your work scott is just how casually you you push perspective like you don't even really even notice it at first, but then when you look at it again, you're like, "Oh, whoa, that is deep." Right. Yeah, like that one, like that. There's there's so much volume and like the the world exists past the borders so much in that drawing. Well, and again, I you know keep harping on the one thing of the Archie Goodwin thing, but even this one splash page kind of talks again about what Ar Archie said. Um, in that time that I got the uh, critique from him was, you know, the background there behind Nova is all it's, you know, it's, it's moving. It is, has depth to it. it. It does have perspective and everything, but it's very kind of calm and regular in how it's worked out. And all the action crazy stuff is mostly there for Nova. 
um, and his speed lines or his fist coming straight at you. Um, but what's great is it makes what Nova's doing that seem that much more special. Like if you exactly you, know, you think about some of the you know like '90s bad comic book drawing where it's just it best case scenario like maybe a well drawn exciting figure doing something with almost no background or speed lines and stuff and and it's so much more interesting and powerful when you see a great pose and a great character doing something remarkable being grounded in the reality you know right absolutely um and even shots like this this is supposed to be handling the the this moment uh caught in time though it you know there is a certain amount of speed or whatever involved <clears throat> of of hulk or hawk Hawkeye doing this flip um, over these guys, whatever he's been shooting arrows and stuff. That's um, remarkable. I don't think I ever saw that one before. Wow, that's great. That's one of my favorites. I've always loved. I always love the the arrow in the gun, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> like yeah. not not concerned. Like the like he's not concerned at all. The arrow he can hit. He can no, hit no, I mean, just co compositionally, it's great. The perspective is great. The Gil Kane inspired upshot of the creep is great, and then just the fact that you have those packing crate things and then you made the one in the background smaller to you know to really drive back the point that we're you know that that perspective is getting smaller um i mean <laughs> some people would have just made the one in the background in that layer that you have with x is just black but scott's like nah i want to put more lines in there yeah you know? <laughs> never never enough lines well I mean, it's good that he inks his own stuff now because i mean how many people are he is he going to destroy yeah how, yeah, how many people have had to suffer and be put in the hospital because of Scott's <laughs> drawings? Drawing. Well, Dan's had to suffer through a few pages, but uh, Doug Hazelwood was the one on mostly on the Flash stuff, which was the last real anchor that I had on anything. And yeah, that poor man was put through his paces because I did all those things on Flash stuff. That's where I learned that with yeah. Grodd or we did it with Crossfire after that. I couldn't find the Crossfire piece to bring on here. Um, but I, that became almost a stable piece for a while that I would show these giant down shots of the entire city being, you know, terrorized by the villain or, or whatever it was. Um, and yeah, my poor anchors, whenever they had to deal with that kind of crap. Yeah, no, you're brutal. Some might say a villain. <laughs> <laughs> so then it was, uh, you know, different ways of trying to show the speed and dynamics in here, even in the flying pose or the running pose. Mm -hmm. um, here, this was fun. This was a close-up shot. One. Yeah, it's a great yeah. one. I did like three or four of these Smallville covers. This is the one I really liked um, because it was different. It was down the giant goggles, and yet you still felt the speed of everything going on with the air rushing by. Yeah. That's a really exceptional one. What else do we have? Oh, this showed the zoom symbol that it's reversed. Yeah. I love that one. So, Scott, so you like how like, you did the flash, and you have. And I have seen a million, not a million, that's not fair, a hundred thousand um, <laughs> of your flash sketches. And I know that each one is different. Like when you do a convention sketch, you get asked to draw the flash or zoom all the time, but you never draw the same pose. Like, is that- Well, some of them I think turn out very similar because it just flows out of my hand easy that way. But yeah, I try not to duplicate them too much. Because when, when you say you draw at least- at least one flash per show? Um, it depends. It's one of those weird things where things come and go with stuff. Like um, I was just at the um, Utrecht show, the uh, Dutch Comic-Con, and I drew a cold. I had a Zoom. Um, and you got a cold and you drew a Zoom. But I'm bummed. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, and I did a store signing before that where I had a flash and a Zoom uh, that I had sold. But I don't think I actually drew any flashes at that con. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there'll there'll be those cons where it turns around where all of a sudden I've drawn three gorilla, gorilla grads or um, Solomon Grundy's or um, often when I was in Spain they like Scarlet Witch man. I was really? drawing Scarlet Witch after Scarlet Witch after there. Yeah, 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 over and over again. WandaVision. Yeah, I love a Scarlet Witch. All right, I have one last flash question. Mm. Um. I've learned a lot. I've learned to do the bounce and learned to make the lightning have its own. Yeah, the lightning has some good bounce there. I really like the the top uh, third, um, the left-hand side. Over here. No, yeah, yep, over there. Yeah. I like that portion. 
well, I started, I started to start to figure it out, starting to get better at it. Um, yeah. But now you also seem to draw kind of like these lines here. Um, that almost like he was in that position a second ago. You see what I'm doing? Oh yeah, those uh, the after effect uh, drawing uh, a uh, after image. Yeah, yeah. This this kind of thing here. Yep. Do you, yep. Do you have a system for that, or are you just kind of like? Uh, well, the one thing I added to that. Hang on one second. Uh, there was a question we had here. Um, how was it working with Keith? Keith's awesome. Keith is one of the, after Jeff, he's probably my next favorite guy to work with. Um, because, uh, Keith was very open-ended. Um, Keith was very much like, I'll give you this much of the puzzle. You run with the next. Don't even tell me what you're doing. I right. want to get your piece of the puzzle as you give it. And then I'm going to go, okay. And that's going to make me think of this piece of the puzzle. And you just keep building and building and building. Right. But to go what Jeff's talking about, um, Okay, with the first piece that I had drawn, where is that? Here it is. Um, I was doing some of those after images there uh, as the yellow. Gotcha. Um, as, oh, I see what you're doing as the yellow. All right. Now, George had done, no, oh, they're not in this one for George. George had done a bunch of that where he was drawing after images and stuff in his, uh, the trail. Um, right. Davis usually did not. I don't know if those other guys did or not. Um, here, this is where I think I started playing with it. There, you see by his foot and his body, there are those the images in there. Right. But I also used to start taking, um, at the time, eraser because I had uh, Doug inking me or here I was inking the cover myself. I would do with whiteout. I would do all the speed lines and then mixed in with the real lightning that's coming off the belt or the ears. I would change his after images of the boot or whatever, a hand or something mm. like that was going on. But then I would... Irre yeah, I would make them irregular lines and I would go up and down with them almost like the lightning too, but I, I would see. do them in white to break oh, the white. Lines, lines. Interesting. All right. That's tricky. That's a tricky little move. Let's see if there's another. Yeah, there's some of it here, but that was pretty early on. All right. All right. Starting to decipher Collins. Yeah. Which you just have to have the Rosetta Stone. Just give it a few decades. <laughs> give it a few decades, Jeff. I'm sure it'll be fine. Oh God. If I had a few decades, Steve, that might make me feel better. Yeah, see here. There's the lightning coming off the belt and stuff, but then there's white shapes in the speed lines. Gotcha. But there I colored orange. But um and there to imply, yeah, the, the after effects of the arm or leg that was running and posing and stuff like that, but then it would uh meld with that kind of speed force uh right. after images. So I'm going to go ahead and cheat and use a little, little whiteout. See, that's not cheating. <laughs> yeah. Well, having that's exactly how I do it, how do it. That's cheating. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. See, that looks good. Yeah. Got it. Okay. okay. Jeff is mountain master drawing the flash, all due to this podcast. Well, I mean, we <laughs> said we. Share some secrets, and we did. Sharing right. is caring. There you go. That's not bad. All right, one last question, and then right. I know that everyone has dinner to go to and stuff. So since he's moving so fast, Scott, how did you handle lighting him? Did you throw shadow on him? Like, how would you approach the idea of um, showing a, the, the direction of light? Uh, that was one of the hallmarks of the other big thing that I had done on the, um, the series was that I had taken out light sources. Ah. So, um, I don't know if that was a conscious, you know, uh, logical decision for flash that he's moving too fast for, uh, lighting to be really affecting him necessarily, whatever. Um, right. I remember at the time that I was impressed more with computer coloring that was coming up, um, and how that could be run. I remember looking at, uh, Ollie optics on. Um, on the Steve Rural World's finest stuff and different things at that time, thinking, wow, this stuff is getting so good. If I keep trying to force my shadows and different things on the character in the book, then sometimes that's fighting whatever the colorist is trying to do. Right. Um, so uh, I don't know if you guys remember, but my sketchbook around this time uh, for Flash and for Legion of Superheroes, I had been doing sketches where it was just the line drawing of the the poses of the figures or different things going on. Um, 
and you guys kept responding to that sketchbook really well, um, thinking you were liking the just the line work itself, kind of like this stuff. Um, and then I just sprung that on Flash, and then it. I just... remember. I remember it, Scott. Jeff was opposing it every step of the way, but I was right there championing you. <laughs> you know, I, I, I tend to be the naysayer in the group. Very negative. Just yeah. For, for all of you out there at home, Jeff Johnson is very negative. Negative. Yeah. So it just became one of those things that seemed like it was an extra advantage for us on Flash stuff that I didn't put in the shadows. I didn't put the stuff in. Um, and it seemed to, in its own way, um, you know, add to the speed of the character running. That if he's got room for shadows and all that feathering and rendering and different things going on with it, like a lot of other heroes have, right? Um, that slows him down. Right. It's as if he is faster than light. Da da da. You know, I love that. I always thought that was really interesting that you that you did that, and that I'm like, because I as I've been studying him, trying to figure out what's going on. I'm like. Scott doesn't throw down shadow. He's not doing that on the flash when he's running. Yeah. He's like, he leaves that for slow people. <laughs> well, and that definitely seems evocative of the Infantino too. You know, right. like, 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 absolutely. Um, one of the things that was nice about it for my end as a working artist at that time, um, trying to learn this craft was that because I didn't spend time rendering all those shadows and doing all those things. And it was sort of a time saver on that. I could spend twice the amount of time or more um, reworking my panels, reworking the storytelling. Is this the best shot? Is that right. second panel the best one? Should that be in a different order or should this panel be bigger or smaller? I could spend so much more time now on the actual drawing of the figure or the actual organization of the storytelling in the panels. Okay. Um, then I could think of those things like, we know when it was speed force panels that there was a yellow border around them um, or, you know, flash time versus normal time, all those things. I could uh, expend that brain power on that stuff because I wasn't expending all that energy um, uh, doing all those delineated shadows, which like, you know, most people would expect if you're doing a Batman book or um, right. some other book, a daredevil book or something like that, that relies so much upon shadow and that kind of uh, ambiance. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it was a really interesting stylistic and thematic choice. Yeah, no, it was good. It was totally good. Yes, uh, all right, so the last thing as we wrap this up now, I wanted to talk about real briefly was this. Okay, yeah, your new Wonder Woman stuff. New Wonder Woman stuff. Uh, this is sensational Wonder Woman special. I think it was out a week or so here in America. I was just talking about it to people in Utrecht, so I don't know if they're going to get it in the next week or month or when they're going to get it. This is one of the covers um there's of course since it's a modern comic book there must be like 12 covers so sure. <laughs> this is another one that came in the box i had this box when i got back now this is another oh, nice. cover for the issue nice yeah so there's a bunch of covers for it it's really nice um but like that's the line art for page one um i got to do a uh 20 page story um which was, or all this was originally uh, put together that was going to be for a digital uh, Wonder Woman comic book, but that got delayed or canceled or whatever it was. Um, so all the pages are top half, bottom half, that they would have been for digital. Um, but I got to do in a 20 page story, uh, I joked about this with Jeff a bunch that uh, it was actually, it should have been like a three issue, four issue miniseries. Oh, yeah, there's so much story. Like, <laughs> Even, I, even when I posted about it, I'm like, if you want your your the best value for your comic book dollars, this is the book because you're getting four issues in 20 pages. Yeah, I had to cram it in pretty good. I, I think ultimately it did still play very well. Oh, yeah. Um, but it's Wonder Woman and Dr. Fate guest stars. Uh, I had a lot of fun with all that stuff. <clears throat> and then they are uh, teaming up versus at first a uh, – Godzilla kind of monster, this big guy who's coming in and trashing the uh, coast city or something. I forget in DC comic books, but then eventually it leads up to these other dimensional um, Lovecraftian monsters. Oh. Yeah, so it was lots of fun, lots of fun. It's and that's really good. That's really good. And I got to write, draw, and color this one. Oh, yeah, the colors are great. I'm also really proud of how this all work. Yeah. Yeah. No, the colors are dynamic. They're beautiful. Nicely done, Mr. Thanks, guys. 
Yeah, all right. Go buy it, people. Me and Jeff are getting ours for free. <laughs> I mean, that's that is one of the benefits of knowing someone for 30 years. <laughs> all right. All right. In conclusion, yes, Bill O'Donnell, Jeff is a curmudgeon, but very lovable. What? How in any of that conversation <laughs> are you the curmudgeon? That doesn't, I mean, what? <laughs> it wasn't fair at all, was it? It's not I, accurate at all. It's not <laughs> accurate at all. Thanks, it just Morgan. seems, it just seems, it seems inappropriate for the show. It just doesn't seem. But see here, you know, you get this. Oh, demo, so, Jeff. So, Nicely demo, done. Jeff. That's true. That's true. All right. All right. All right. Can you um, hold it together with the lightning. See. Well, luckily I had a coach. I had a coach during the Maury Hollowell just gorgeous. We know she's talking about Jeff and his friends. Uh, all right. All right, guys. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. I do feel as though I was able to get. I mean, that's a mess, but I learned a lot. That's by great. working working through it. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing your secrets. Absolutely. Yeah. Next week, are we doing Wonder Man? <laughs> sure. Next, <laughs> next week, Wonder is Man, Way the next, Rat. Next week, Guilty Pleasure, Flash Gordon. Scott and I will be acting out the entire film. <laughs> That's that is money in the bank. <clears throat> Excuse me. There yeah. you go. <laughs> Oh, all right, gentlemen. Let me, uh, Scott, if you want to put up the final, that's a ticket. And then yep. let me, let me God, that's, it's, the teamwork makes the dream work. Um, hang on a second. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. This was fun. <laughs> yeah, very hey, good. All right, here's the music. And we, yeah. Nice. Don't forget to check out all the information in the description box below. Have a great night, everybody. See Thank you. Next week. <laughs>